not the only one up here. I swear there's more. Hey. Well, good evening. Happy Valentine's Day. Can we say that? I think we can say that. It's the day of love, right? And what are we here for? We're here to celebrate our Savior's love. Let's see how we tie that in together. It's really cool. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for this evening. We thank you that you love us with an unconditional, Lord, incomprehensible love. It goes beyond our wandering, Lord. It goes beyond our sin. It reaches down and it grabs us and it pulls us closer to you. Lord, and that's what we desire here tonight is to be closer to you, to understand your word more, Lord, to, uh, to be in your presence. So we ask that you would pour your spirit out and fill this place, fill our hearts and our minds with you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're able, let's go ahead and stand for the first song. Pour out your spirit, Lord. Pour out your spirit, Lord. to be like Jesus. Pour out your spirit, Lord. Pour out your spirit, Lord. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus, the King of glory. Jesus, Jesus. 
sacrifice of praise. The Father, take my heart, every part today. Let's just sing that to Him. So I give my life. So I give my life a sacrifice. Father, take my heart, every part today. Lord God, that's our prayer, that you would take our life, Lord, as a living sacrifice unto you. Pour out your spirit, Lord. Have your way here tonight. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. All right, announcements. This is not my gift. So, pray for Pastor Mike right now. He is in Israel, and he's just soaking it up for all of those that are thinking about going on the trip so that when we actually go on the trip, man, it's going to be awesome. So he's over there right now. If you have Facebook, um, hop on Facebook. Make sure you like Calvary Chapel Susanville, and he's doing updates. I saw one today. Um, It's really cool. So continue to keep him in prayer while he's over there. Um, Let's see. Men's Conference, Little Country Church in Reading. Make sure that we sign up. If you haven't, guys, if you haven't grabbed one of these, I grabbed a stack of them so that I could take and hand out to people at work. Um, Because this is different than any other men's retreat, I think, that we've actually been going to recently with um, with the the speaker, uh, Lieutenant General William Jerry Boykin. Um, This is going to cross lines to people that would not normally come to a men's conference. So... It's up there, so I'm holding the flyer like you can see it when it's really big on the screen. So, <laughs> told you this is not my gift. Okay, so the Ark Encounter that's uh, coming up August 8th through 10th. I think that's going to be a really fun trip. It'll be a pretty quick trip, but uh, um, to see Noah's Ark life size, that's going to be pretty cool. So, make sure you sign up for that if you're interested. Um, September 7th through 8th is the Women's Conference at Little Country Church in Reading. Um, the, do we have a flyer for that? We'll have a flyer for that one. I think the topic is Blessed Hope out of Titus 2.13. Um, Sandy McIntosh is going to be there, and um, that should always be a good time. It's always neat to get together with big groups like that. So Now that's over. In your prayers, continue to pray for uh, Florida, uh, for those that are grieving, those that lost people, those that uh, are hurt. Um, horrible, oper- horrible things like this that happen, right? It shows the evil in men's hearts, but it also gives an opportunity for people to see that they need a savior. That through trials, through tribulation, through horrible circumstances, um, God's love and mercy and grace can be shown and seen through that. So continue to pray for them. in my 
shaking when my world is shaking. When my world is shaking, you are my firm foundation. You are my rock of ages. Jesus, you are in every circle.
Every eye is fixed on you Burn away every distraction So you can move Come and move Let's sing that again Lord, you have our attention Every eye is fixed on you. I burn away every distraction so you can move. Come and move. We won't hesitate.
cannot stand when I cannot stand I fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay when I cannot stand I fall on you Jesus Jesus you're my hope and stay Lord God, I pray that those words would be so true, that you would be our hope, you would be our stay, you would be our foundation, Lord, and we would stand upon you, the rock, because you are immovable. All our hope, Lord, all of our future, all of everything rests in you. Have your way here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, go ahead and say hi to each other. Well, again, here we are, and I am not Pastor Mike. So, if you would, turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4, the last chapter of Philippians. And no, we aren't going to make it through the whole chapter. I was hoping I was going to actually get through more than what we are. But it turns out there's just too much good stuff. So, Philippians <laughs> chapter 4. And I know you guys all just sat down, but let's go ahead and stand as we read God's word. Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore you... Euodia, and I implore Sintichi to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men, the Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good, of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everything and in all, everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that, the, that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all 
and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things that sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's house. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Lord, we thank you for your word. God, we, we look forward to what it is going to say to us tonight. Lord, I pray that the, the words from me would be clear and I wouldn't mess things up. Lord, that I would just disappear and, and you would remain. God, have your way and pour your spirit out here. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and be seated. <clears throat> so, we finally finished up last time I got to be up here, um, chapter 3. If we remember, chapter 3 was um, one of the best descriptions of a true Christian's life, right? It covered our past and leaving our old nature, our flesh behind. It talked about our current walk, right? What we're doing right now and pressing on and pursuing Christ. And it covered our future, what we get in the future. Um, it covered this book so far has covered consolation in Christ, comfort of love, fellowship of the Spirit, affection and mercy, being like-minded Christians. It covered that we, now as Christians, are the new covenant. We worship God in spirit. We rejoice in Christ. We rejoice in the Lord. We have no confidence in the flesh. We leave our old nature behind, and we press on. So, like chapter 3, past, the current, and the future, this chapter, chapter 4, has a three-part message. And I know that Paul, in, in reading all of this, didn't break his letter up into chapters, but thankfully for us, we have chapters that we can go by. And chapter 4, just like chapter 3, has a three-part message. The three points, but one specific idea. This chapter that relates to the entire book. Remember, the entire book is about joy, the joy of the Lord, and, and Paul being even in prison in the darkest, um, dankest, right? Remember that word? Um, prison, he still wrote this, and you could still see Paul oozing joy even in prison. So this chapter is about peace, but first... To have peace, you have to know Christ. To have true peace, you have to know who the giver of that true peace is. John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your, let not your heart be troubled Neither let it be afraid. You see, Christians can rest no matter what's going on in true peace because they know the true peace giver. We can know it because it's from our perfect Savior. It's a supernatural peace. It's not, like Jesus said, it's not of the world. It's not like peace and safety and all of the stuff that the world is going to try to throw on us, it's in hardships and trials, in the tribulation and in the good times and in the rejoicing. It's, oh man, I know what happens. I know that my name is written in the book of life. I got peace no matter what goes on. It's supernatural. Romans 8, 6 says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded minded is life and peace see to be spiritually minded we know christ the more we know christ the more we can have that spiritual mind the more we have that spiritual mind the more we understand that who cares what happens here it's all about the end game right it's all about heaven it's all about being with him 
So the kind of, that kind of peace, that supernatural peace, only comes through the Holy Spirit from the Prince of Peace, right? Um, to back that up, Isaiah 9.6 says, and this is one of the most quoted you know, Christmas verses, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So, this chapter being all about peace, we need to base it on the more we know him, the more peace we can have. Verses 1 through 5, which is all we're going to get through here tonight, um, is about peace with each other. Peace among the brethren, right? Inside this body, inside this family that's sitting here in this room tonight, peace with each other. Verses 6 through 9 seem to be about how to have peace with ourselves, right? Because that's kind of an important thing. Sometimes people spend their entire life just beating themselves up, going over, hashing over sins that have been forgiven through Christ. And that kind of negates everything that he did for us on the cross. He just kind of says, I know you did it, but I still feel like this. I still feel that. We need to understand that we need to have peace with ourselves because God has forgiven us. He has peace with us, right? His blood washed us clean. Verses 10 through 23, Paul teaches us how to have peace in every situation. So the total sum of all this, peace with each other, peace with ourselves, peace in every situation, the total sum goes right along with the book. It equals joy. Joy, right? That's the main focus of the entire theme of the book. So since we've finished chapter 3, right, we're moving on. Paul says, now that you've understand all these things, we've kind of laid the foundation for joy. We've kind of laid the foundation for your past nature, your present nature, and your future. Now we're going to move on. He says, therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. When I started reading this, I'm like, wow. He's writing this letter to an entire church. And when I read all of those words that he used, those are words that, that I would use if I was writing to my spouse, to my wife. Those are, those are words that, that super close family members that love each other and are inseparable because the love is so deep. Those are words that they would use for each other. And Paul is addressing the entire church with this. So you can see how personal this letter is to Paul. How personal the church of Philippi is to Paul. He says, my beloved, the word is Adelphos, those who are from the same womb. He's relating them as, as blood relatives, right? Because we're all now adopted through Christ. So we're all related now through Christ. He's relating to them as brothers and sisters. He says, longed for brethren. Um, the word is epipothetos, it means yearned for, greatly loved from afar, okay? So everybody's been on a trip, and when you're on a trip and you leave someone that you love behind, when you're gone, you're like, oh, and you just have that, that ache and that longing and that yearning to be back with that loved one, right? This is what Paul's using. My longed for, my yearned for, greatly loved people. He says, my joy. The word is kara, right? Um, it means what gives me joy, what fills my heart, what gives me gladness. He's telling this to the church. You guys are the ones that fill my heart, that give me joy joy and gladness. He says, my crown, Stephanos, the crown here is not the crown of a king, 
the crown here is one of the ones that's made like a wreath of entwined stuff, a laurel that they would use. Hey, we're in the Olympics right now, right? So back then, the winner of the Olympics, rather than gold, silver, and bronze, they would get the crown, right? That laurel. And it, it represented a badge of honor. It represented, man, the best, the one that won, the favorite. So Paul is, is being so personal with these. Therefore, my beloved and longed-for brethren, my joy and crown, he says, so stand fast. Stand fast. Now, me, okay, I can relate to that. I really love this. He uses a military term here, right? He uses a term when you're on a skirmish line or in a battlefield and a, the opposition is coming this direction at you. He's saying, stand fast, hold the line, right? So you kind of often wonder, why would he use a military term when he's talking about joy, when he's talking about peace? Just because we can find peace through Christ because we know the future, right? We know what the, the end of the battle is. We know what the, the total end game is doesn't mean that there isn't still a battle. It doesn't mean that there isn't still a war that's going on. If there wasn't a battle and a war that was going on continually right now as we're here, I mean, everybody talks about Warfare Wednesday, right? That has the sound people in the back here and the worship team and Pastor Mike and the everything that the enemy just tries to thwart and mess up everything because he knows that there's a good thing going on. So there is a constant battle that's happening, right? So if there wasn't that constant battle, we would have no need for other stuff in the Bible that the scripture talks about, like in Ephesians. Ephesians says, put on the whole armor of God. Why do I need armor if there's not a battle, right? Why do I need a shield? Why do I need a helmet or a sword if there's not a war that's carrying on? It says, put on the full armor, the whole armor of God that you may be able to, here we go, stand against the wiles of the devil. Devil, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Now, by a raise of hand, how many of you guys have ever seen, with your eyes, seen any of those things? A couple of you, okay, some of you. Or have you seen those things? Have you seen a principality? Right? A lot of people, they're all, I've never seen that. We see the effects of it, right? We see what happens with the warfare and what it does to families, how it breaks things apart. But visually, that stuff, those battles, the warfare, the sword fighting, the angels against the demons, we don't really see that. So a lot of the times when things are going good, we're like, well, if things are going good. I don't need to worry about stuff, right? And that's when the enemy can sneak in the most. It sneaks in the most. So Paul's writing to this church saying, look, you guys need to stand fast in God because if you're not standing fast in God, if you don't have that full armor of God protecting you, ready for the battle, right? Holding that skirmish line. If you're not doing that, the enemy's going to creep in and you are going to have issues in your church because remember he's writing not to just a person he's writing to an entire church so there's going to be problems those fiery darts that come from the enemy are going to hurt if we're not grounded if we don't have that armor of god stand fast don't let anyone move you off christ jesus our foundation and we can look out um 
at any given point, right, and ask anybody, what kind of things would kind of knock you off your foundation? Maybe not completely, right? But what kind of things would knock you off balance to where you're like, whoa, Lord, I don't, and you'd start to question things. We all have certain things. Luckily, God's not going to allow us to be tested beyond what we can handle. But there's always something, right? I mean, you think about, like, the families in Florida. Could that knock somebody off of their foundation, losing a loved one like that? Keep those things in mind. As we do that, we understand that that battle that we're preparing for, that we're trying to get the armor of the Lord, armor of God put on, that battle is, it's, that war is bloody, right? It's horrible, and the enemy fights dirty. That's why we need to stand fast on Christ Jesus. He said, Jesus said, John 16, verse 33, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. So we're talking about here tonight, peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Jesus didn't say, you might. He says, you know, things coming up, there's going to be some things, and you might have tribulation. He says, you shall. It is going to happen. It is a fact, right? We need to be in God's word enough to make sure that when those things happen, it doesn't redirect us. It doesn't take our focus off of Christ. It doesn't cause church separations. It doesn't cause division between a brother and a sister in Christ at church. In the church of Philippi, apparently there was some people that those kind of things, that was happening to, right? So something was coming in, and all of a sudden those tribulations, those trials, those ways of thinking was separating people. There was a couple women that had brought some kind of co conflict between the two of them, so much so that it was damaging the church body, right? It was threatening the very witness of the church in Philippi, okay? It was so bad that the church in Philippi ratted these ladies out right, to Paul, and said, dude, you got to take care of this, right? It was causing problems. See, sometimes we as Christians, we're human, right? This is a big body. Everybody is from different backgrounds. Everybody's from different, and so sometimes we'll get an idea about something, and then get matter of fact about it, and then get, yes, this is the way, but not considering that somebody else has a different direction maybe, right? We're not talking about foundational Christian things. We have to believe in Jesus Christ. We have to believe that he, was died, that he died and was resurrected. We're not talking about those things. We're talking about other things, silly things, it would seem sometimes, right? But when people get so matter-of-fact and dogmatic about things, they'll dig in their heels and they're unwilling to even consider or to love the other person, right? People have issues. I don't know if that's news to any of you, right? But people have issues. I'm just going to let you know. This is everybody's light went on and they went, ah, what, really? Chuck Smith said, churches split over the dumbest things because people are dumb. That's Chuck Smith, right? Oh, love it. And we get to say dumb in, you know, in a message. That's, very, that's pretty cool. So churches split over the dumbest things because people are dumb, right? Chuck was talking about during a time during his church, and this was awesome. This was just on the radio today. I'm like, oh, thank you, Lord. I get to use that tonight, right? So he was talking about a time in their church when they were starting to do some remodeling, right? And they had taken over an old building, and it was they had a ratty old 
podium up there and Chuck's, well, let's modernize it. The chairs are horrible. Let's change out the chairs so everybody can be more comfortable. Hey, the podium's horrible. It's leaning. It's cracking. It's falling apart. Maybe we could run a mic through it and do, you know what I mean? Modernize it. So he's made that way. We're going to do that. And one of the ladies in the church comes up to him and says, hey, brother Chuck, uh, what are you doing? You know, this podium was made by so-and-so so so many years ago and there's been so many just profound messages taught with by this pot from behind this podium you can't change that what right it's those little things that people think and they have their way of going and i'm going this direction and and i'm not going to change i'm digging in my heels right i'm staying there People are dumb. That's, that's just, that's the way it is, right? And it's ridiculous because people will come to church and they're like, well, I'm not going to go to that church. They dim the lights during communion. Pfft, what's that about, right? Or they come and they go, wow, the sound guy had the music way, way too loud. I am not going to there. But little do they know that the sound guy turns the music up to kind of cover up the joyful noise that a lot of people make, right? So that's besides the point. But those people wear jeans at church? Oh, we can't go there. That's ridiculous. You can't wear jeans at church, let alone a Hawaiian shirt, right? I mean, Calvary Chapel was founded on Hawaiian shirts, okay? So, but people split, Okay, because of dumb things like that, because they're not considering the other person. They're not willing to yield. It's not even a matter of of true things that are from the Bible. It's just I'm not yielding my way. I, I don't love you enough to yield to you, right? So this was happening in Philippi, where the one person, I'm sure these little these two ladies that were at each other, you know, out in the foyer, you can see one just running around and working everybody that's out there. Well, did you know about this? And here's what I'm thinking. We should go this. Are you on my side? And we're going to go like this with this direction, have everything going. And then the other lady was probably Sunday after church, right? Going and seeing people at their house. Hey, how you doing? I just thought I'd bring you over some cookies. But did you know what she said that, you know, And so they're just working at each other and trying to work the congregation and it was splitting up the church enough so that Paul had to address it from prison. Okay? This was a big enough issue that Paul is addressing it from prison. Okay? He says, I implore you, I'm begging you, you Euodia, and I implore you, I'm begging you, Sintiche, Sintiche, however we pronounce it, they pronounce it, to be of the same mind in the Lord. Here these two women are causing so much grief. And he's, he's begging them, look, you don't know what you're doing. You're, you're hurting this body by having a difference, right? He'll go on and he talks about how involved these ladies were in ministry, In the ministry, in the church, they were heavily involved. They were definitely believers, right? They probably helped build that church in Philippi. I mean, that's how, from ground zero all the way up, involved that these ladies were. But they had something that had come between them. And I can only imagine that women's ministries, right? Women's ministries are hard. Hard. I pff, hard. Without getting all crazy, right? I probably shouldn't use that word describing women's ministries, but um, there's a lot of sensitivity. There's a lot of emotion, right? There's a lot of other things that oh, well, right? I don't know what's going on, but there's a lot of things that happen in the mix with women's ministries or just with women, period. Praise the Lord for it because, guys, we don't have that, right? We don't have quite the emotions and quite the sensitivity. 
So praise God. That's how the Lord made them, right? Guys, it's easy, right? Dude, you're being such an idiot. Stop, right? We can be blatantly honest with each other. We don't care about feelings. We don't care if you're going to walk away sad or if I make you cry, right? Cool if I make you cry because then I got something on you, right? But, but we don't care. It's like, dude, stop, right? With women's ministries and with women's counseling and stuff like that, you have to be much more careful. You have to be sensitive to each other. You have to care and lovingly allow the Holy Spirit to make sure that you're saying what really actually needs to be said. Because that's how God created women is to be more sensitive, right? Guys are thick. We used to go like this with our kids all the time. Dude, dude, you are so thick in the school that nothing is getting through your head, right? That's guys. That's why we can say, dude, stop it, right? We can't say that to women because they'll start, right? Tears well up. I'm telling you right now, that's why God gave me boys. That's why God gave me boys, because that sensitive thing, I just would not have, oh man, they, girls would have me wrapped around their fingers. So, Paul encourages these two women the same way that he encourages the entire church, right? He encouraged them in chapter 1. If you remember chapter 1, it says, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Right? They weren't doing that. There was, there was a division, and they were separated because of that. So he's encouraging them specifically and the entire church. And he says, I urge you also, true companion... So he's talking to somebody specific here. Help these women who labored with me in the gospel. So here he's now giving you kind of what their resume is. They labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose name are in the book of life. So he encourages, hey, not just the pastor to go fix that. Not just, you know, a couple of the elders. Not just the, the one woman that's in charge of the ladies' ministries. Go fix that, right? He says, no. The congregation, everybody, we're family. We're, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. If something is broken, let's all rally around it and repair it, right? Let's all rally around this and fix whatever has been broken or strained or caused separation. He's urging the entire church to help with the situation. The reason being is we all have heard stories. Some of us may know people that in a church, when you have a situation, whatever it is, the Hawaiian shirt, somebody might go, yeah, forget it. I, I don't get it. And all of a sudden, they've left. Now they're out of fellowship. We don't know what direction they go. Maybe, they, hopefully, praise the Lord if they go to another church and find something that they can fit in, right? But we don't know. We don't want people just to wander off because of nitpicky little things in our body. James 5, 19 and 20 says, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Paul's very clear to the importance of these two women, right? So they're causing a major disruption in the church. And a lot of times we'll just kick him out, right? That'll fix it. Kick him out. We don't need that deal with that, you know, disruption and all the hate and discontent that they're spreading, right? Just ask them to leave. No. Repair it. They're brothers. They're sisters in Christ. These were very influential, active women. 
And then he also says the one most important thing right there, whose names are in the book of life. Right? Those two ladies, whatever they were arguing about, whatever they were dividing that church about, he reminds the whole church, look, their names are still in the book of life. They are saved just like you and me. We're all going to the same place. God has redeemed all of us, right? Let's fix that. That's how important these people were to him. James 5.16 says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. If there's issues between us, confess it, right? That is the first step to, to removing those things that cause division, cause problems in our church, in our body, in our family, right? David said in Psalm 133, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to, to dwell together in unity. It is like Precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. Now, I don't know what it's like to have a bunch of Crisco dropped on your head, right? Apparently, Aaron really liked it. But I can relate to the first part, okay? How good it is for us to dwell in unity, right? To have that, you know, the word koinonia, fellowship, right? To have that, that bond with each other that's inseparable because our bond is not necessarily this direction between us. Our bond is this direction between us and him. And the closer we are to him, right? It's like a triangle, the closer we are to him, here's you, here's me, the closer we get to him, just like in a marriage, right? The two, the closer they get to Jesus, the closer they get to each other. That's our bond. Our bond is through Christ. The point is we should be helping each other as a body, right? Because all of our names are written in the book of life. He goes on to share how these two ladies and how the whole body of Christ can find peace. In verse 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. He makes it kind of clear, right? It's easy to understand. Rejoice in the Lord. Everybody can understand that, right? Rejoice in the Lord. Then he puts the cap on it. Always. Always. And just, hey, in case you weren't listening, okay? In case some of you were taking notes and got so busy with the last thing that you didn't hear what I said, rejoice in the Lord always. Some of you may have just nodded off. It's okay. Um, I'm going to say it again, right? Again, I say rejoice. Paul is making it very very, very clear that this is an important concept. Very important concept. I'm pretty sure he meant what he was saying. Philippians 3.1 says, Finally, my brethren, brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing to you, to me indeed, is not grievous. So he already said it in, in chapter 3. He says, look it, I can say this all day long every day until you get it. It's not a hard thing. Hey, did you get that? Did you get it? Rejoice in the Lord. Oh, wait, you didn't get it? This isn't hard. I can say it again. Rejoice in the... It's, it's not me. It's Paul. He just says, this is easy. I can do this, right? It's that important. Psalm 145, 1 and 2 says, I will extol, extol you, my God, O king, and I will bless your name forever and ever. 
Every day I will bless you and I will praise your name forever and ever. You catch the same vibe, right? Rejoicing in the Lord, praising the Lord every day, forever and ever and every day. And it's just this cycle that goes on. So let me ask you guys something, and don't look around the church, right, tonight. Don't look around or you'll give yourself away, okay? Is there somebody, I saw that, is there somebody, right, that we fellowship with that maybe kind of gets under your skin, okay? And that's, everybody's kind of going, okay, I'm not going to look, I'm not going to look. This is the stiffest I have seen this church. It's awesome, okay? Somebody that gets under your skin, somebody that just rubs you the wrong way maybe somebody you know oh, they sing way out of key when we're doing this they sway they bumped me this is my space don't but right okay there's all sorts of things there's we're people those things happen okay so when we are truly truly from your heart rejoicing in the Lord and your eyes are fixed on Jesus, do you even remember why that person bugs you? I'm going to answer that. No, you don't. Because you're not thinking of them. You're thinking of the Lord. You're rejoicing in the Lord. And that's why this is so important. This is why Paul is repeating himself here is because, look, if we're rejoicing in the Lord, we're not worrying about how loud the, the sound guy made the stuff, the music, right? We're not worrying that Pastor Mike's wearing jeans. Can you believe that? You know, it's all of those things go away because our eyes are fixed on the Lord. There's so much for us as Christians to rejoice in the Lord over, right? We're saved. We're saved. That's something to rejoice over. Our sins are washed away. Completely gone, right? How about we're a new creation? I'm pretty thankful for that, right? Because I remember my before Christ days, and I'm glad that I am a completely new, Christ, new person, new creation in Christ, right? How about rejoice in the fact that he gives us power over sin. He gives us the ability to, to overcome our sin nature through him. That's amazing. We have so many things to rejoice over, yet there's so many times we let that one little tiny conflict, that one little tiny rub or bump or sat too close or whatever it was rob us and that's what's happening the enemy is rejoicing we let those things rob us of our own rejoicing in the lord and it steals it from us rejoicing is contagious praise is contagious when you're looking at Christ, when you are praising him and your eyes are fixed on him, you're not looking at anything else. There's nothing else to look at, right? The person next to you, if they go like this, oh, well, he's looking at the Lord, right? It's contagious. When, when Deb and I were first married, as, um, we're still, we're new Christians, Still new Christians. Um, I was working three jobs, right, to try to make sure that I could feed Noah. We didn't have Caleb at the time. Noah was a big eater, right? Even as a little munchkin, he was a, so. One of the jobs that I was working was landscaping, right? And I got to work with one of the brothers from our church had um, a landscape company that had like four, four different crews that would go out and I got to be part of one of the crews but a lot of the times he would take me along side with him right I mean this dude knew everything about big commercial landscaping 
you know, irrigation, all sorts of stuff. So I was like, cool, yeah, I'll go along. And so I would go along with work to work with him. And I was a new Christian, mind you. And so we'd go out and we'd talk about Bible. And I was like, that's cool. You know, let's talk about the Lord. Yeah, I like this. Every time we'd go out, when we weren't talking, he was singing. He was singing a worship song, a praise song, or a hymn, or humming something. And I'm like, that's kind of weird, right? Why are you just singing? It could be 110. We were from Fresno, right? It was hot. So it could be 110, and we would be digging a trench by hand, right, through hard pan, and he's, Lord, I lift your name on. And I'm just like, what's going on with this dude? This is horrible. I hate this, right? I'm tired. It's hot. I'm sweating. I'm thirsty. I want to go home. He's just praising the Lord. It was, it was awesome. Pretty soon, I found myself humming. Hmm. Same thing that he was humming, right? Went talk some more, and then the longer that we're working together over, you know, weeks, months, and stuff like that, pretty soon he's singing something, and I'm like, oh, cool. And I started singing with him, right? And so we're out there digging trenches and, and doing all this crazy stuff and praising the Lord. We were rejoicing in the Lord. It was contagious, right? That's what I'm saying. It was weird. But then all of a sudden, it got on me, right? And I'm like, ooh, I kind of like that. Ooh, and if I surrender to that, oh, that's cool. Yeah, let's worship the Lord because it's not about this direction anymore. It's about this direction. Side note, it was awesome. So rejoicing in the Lord. Praise, it's contagious. One thing we have to remember when we're rejoicing in the Lord, right? We talked about this the last time Paul talked about rejoicing in the Lord, is that it's not our circumstances, right? It's not what we're going through at that time. That's not what we rejoice in because our circumstances can be horrible. Our circumstances can stink and be the most miserable thing we have ever thought could possibly happen to us, right? We don't rejoice in that. We still, we rejoice in the Lord through those circumstances because we know that God, on the other side of those circumstances or those trials, he's the one that's going to bring us through. So we can't rejoice in the circumstance. We have to rejoice in him because he's the one in control of the circumstances. So these two ladies, obviously they were not at peace with each other. And this is what Paul is encouraging them to do, is find peace with each other. Have the church. We, as the body, need to find peace with each other. We have a pretty awesome body here, right? Our church family is, is amazing. I, I love our church family. People come alongside you when you need something, right? There's always, there's a line. Oh, man, I'm going through this. And everybody goes, ding, 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 ding. Hey, can we help? Can we help? Can we help? Can we help? It's a great body. That's how we should work. But we have to be diligent not to allow those little things to creep in. The little issues, um, they should be non-existent compared to the amazing gift that we have through Christ. That's what we should have. Matthew 5, 12 says, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Great is your reward in heaven. Man, there's something to rejoice about. Paul continues, verse 5, Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. And I had to kind of stop and think about this gentleness thing for a minute, thinking that, hmm, I have to teach through that, right? Gentleness, whatever. So, obviously, some, I know some guys can relate to me, right? Sometimes we might ever so slightly lack a gentle nature, 
Just saying, sometimes, okay? So as I'm looking at this, I'm kind of going, okay, Paul, I want to be able to apply this to the message tonight, but I want to be able to apply it to my life, right? Because everything that happens here from I've said before that I have to teach, I need it twice as much as you guys do. So everything that I say, I have to be diligent to try to do that in my life, right? So I'm looking at this gentleness thing, kind of going, hmm, all right, how do I understand it, Lord? And the best way to understand what God's Word says, right, is to allow God's Word to explain it. So I started doing a, a kind of a study. I got off, not, didn't get off track, but I started getting in deeper just on this one thing, right? Looking through the Bible on gentleness because I wanted God to explain in his way what he wanted us to have here tonight. Let me tell you, it is a big subject. We're going to only kind of scratch the surface of it tonight, right? Because this could be a month of Wednesday nights to even talk about the one thing. First off, gentleness, that's how God is with us, right? That's how God is with us. We are, like Chuck Smith said, dumb. We are dumb people. And God could go, oh my gosh, let's start over, right? That, I don't make mistakes, but we're going to start over from, we're going to make something better. But that's not God. That's not his nature. God is gentle with us. There's a, a verse in Hosea 11, verse 4. He says, I drew them with gentle cords, with bands of love. And I was to them as those who take the yoke from their neck. I stooped down and I fed them. And I'm like, Man, I got this picture of these undeserving, right, me, undeserving, and God just kind of going out of his way to just love me, to just love us, and to, to pull us. And we're like, no, no, I don't want to. No, come here, come here, right? And just this gentle nature of a father with, with his child, Loving them gently. And I'm like, okay, I can kind of relate to that, right? Again, that's why God gave me boys, right? Because I didn't have to really be gentle with them. I could, you know, boys, we can just smack them. Come on, suck it up. Rub some dirt on it, okay? Rub some dirt on it and get back on that bike. Anyway, Psalm 86, 15 says, but you, O oh Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious and long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. Wow. That is our creator God being gentle towards us. We by no means deserve, well, anything good. We deserve just to be wiped away and restarted. But God loves us, and so his gentleness to us is a constant drawing, a constant beckoning, a pulling us towards him. The second example that we're, we'll go through tonight is Jesus. His example is perfect gentleness. He says in Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So a yoke, right, those things that they would put on the oxen, okay, and then they would hook the, the trowel up behind it, and the oxen would pull that thing, those things were made out of layers and layers of wood okay with the the neck cut out and it, it most of them if you especially with a two oxen yoke 
it's going to take two people, if not more, to pick those things up and to put them on the cows or the ox, right? They're heavy. And Jesus says, look it, even though you're going to be doing work in the church, you're going to be doing things. He says, this yoke, nah, it don't weigh nothing, right? Because all of your strength is not you now. All of your strength is me. All of everything that's going to happen when those trials and that, that pressure comes down, it's going to be me lifting it up. Jesus says, I'm gentle. I'm the one that's going to be doing everything for you. I'm helping you along. I'm taking you with me. So the more I looked into um, gentleness, I started seeing, I'm like, oh, okay, I'm kind of getting it, Lord, but I still don't want to be, you know, oh, that guy's so gentle, right? When I say that in a funny way, but right, as, as guys, right, we don't want another guy to come up to us and say, dude, you're so gentle, <laughs> right? We're going to kind of go, shut up, okay? So as I started looking at this, I'm looking, gentleness is not weakness, okay? Gentleness is not weakness. When they came to get Jesus right before the crucifixion, right? He says, don't you know? Are you coming up with swords and all these dudes, spears, and what? He says, don't you know that I can call 12 legion of angels? I could just, hey, hey, guys. And 12 legion of angels are going to come down and help me out. Okay? So I did some little research on that. A legion was 6,000 to 6,800 per legion. Okay? That's over 72,000 angels that Jesus could go, sword, watch this. Hey, 72,000 angels, just like that, okay? So gentleness is not weakness. Because we all know what one angel can do. One angel, right? One angel killed, uh, what was it, A hundred and, what do I have here? 185,000 soldiers, one angel. So imagine what 72,000 could do, right? I mean, you could take over the world, okay? So gentleness is not weakness because I always picture, right? I don't ever picture my Jesus, right, our Jesus, as, oh, right, bless you. You know, this, this kind of a Jesus that they do in pictures, right? He was a tough dude. He was a carpenter. So I'm sure he was strong because they didn't have power tools back then. It was all labor, right? And he worked with his dad. I'm sure growing up, nothing was easy back then. So when I picture Jesus, I don't picture him as this soft whatever, right? I'm picturing this is a dude, right? Gentleness, right? here is not weakness, but it's only using the power that needs to be used in that situation to accomplish God's will. I may have the ability to crush you, but it's not God's will. I don't need to. That's what was happening right there in the garden, okay? Now, there were times where Jesus wasn't quite so gentle, when he cleaned out the, um, when everybody was buying and selling things, right? In the, in the tabernacle and the everything. So money changers, all the animals in there. It's a marketplace basically inside the church. And Jesus walks in and goes, hmm, okay, right? He kind of walks over and he grabs a couple pieces of rope and he starts quiet and just looking watching everybody, and he starts to braid those things, right? Oh, yeah, I'm going to hit you with it, 
right? Braiding it. Yeah, you're getting it too, right? And I could just see him thinking all these things, right? As this whip gets a little bit longer, Luke just taking his time. Keep going. Just keep going. Okay. Yeah, that's about long enough, right? And then one dude cleared out the entire place, right? There's one dude cleared out the entire everything, kicking over the tables, kicking over. So gentleness has its place right here. But when we see Jesus, we understand that that gentleness is, is used to accomplish God's will. It's wisdom. Mike always says, knowledge. Everybody gets knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. I know this, I know this. I have a BA, I have a master's, I have this, I have all this knowledge. But wisdom is the appropriate use of that knowledge. It's the same thing with gentleness. I may have all this power to do this and this and the other, but gentleness says, I don't need to, right? I may just need to come down and give you a hug. Maybe it's a big hug. Who knows, right? But that's what gentleness, and that's the perfect example through Christ. James 3.17 says, But the wisdom that is from high is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, which is what was not happening with the two ladies, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Last thing on gentleness. The reason why Paul is saying this, let your gentleness be known to all men, okay, is because the world is watching. The world is watching us. The world is judging us as Christians. Everybody, I almost guarantee, everybody in this room has talked to somebody that says, yeah, I know a Christian. He does this and he does that. And then on the weekend, he does this and the other. And right? We, everybody's heard that. The world is watching us. Jesus said, by this, all will know that you, excuse me, are my disciples. If you have love for one another. Okay? The world is watching how we handle things, right? If, if all of a sudden we're a hothead and go, the, the, the people that are out there that are like watching Christians, they're like, dude, yeah, you call yourself a Christian and you just did this and did that. The world is watching us and how we handle ourselves. So let me end the message with some encouragement. As Paul encourages peace with each other, peace within the body. 1 Peter 3, verses 8 and 9 says, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Love one another. That's what it's about. That's how we have peace with each other and peace in the body that these two ladies were missing is we love one another. We can only truly love each other by the power of Christ in us. Paul ends that verse right there, for the Lord is at hand. That was way back then, right? We're thinking about that way back then. But you guys know what's happening in today's modern time. How much closer are we to the Lord at hand? Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 says, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Every day that we get closer to the Lord, we, as the body, should be loving each other more, encouraging each other more, right? 
coming alongside each other more. We can only do this in Christ. Um, we have, some of you guys have been to my house, we have over our dining room table a, a chalkboard that's a framed chalkboard, and I love it because my wife puts scriptures on the chalkboard, and every week she changes out the scriptures, right? <clears throat> and this last week kind of goes along with us having the ability to do this and having the ability to not let that person kind of get under our skin and nerves and ugh, it drives me crazy when they, right? Not that, not that. We don't want that. The scripture this last week was Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Wow. That there, that right there is enough for us to just rejoice in the Lord forever. Jesus gave himself for us. And now we, living here, have Christ in us, right? You have Christ in you. You have Christ in you. And all of us are now family, brothers and sisters in Christ, right? Work towards encouraging each other, loving each other in Christ. And the day is getting shorter and shorter, right? The Lord is at hand. Let's, uh, let's worship. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all of the gifts that you have given us. Jesus, we thank you for your perfect example of gentleness. We thank you for this church body and these people here. God, we pray that you would live in us and help us to love each other more than ourselves. Lord, help us to encourage each other with songs and hymns and psalms of praise. Lord, help us to encourage each other and exhort each other to be in the word, be in your word and to love you and grow closer to you. Because Lord, we know that the day is at hand. The Lord is close and we look forward to that time. We thank you for tonight in your precious and your holy name. So let's just go ahead and sing that. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. No longer I, but Christ who lives in me. I'm crucified with Christ. No longer I, but Christ who lives in me. I'm crucified with Christ. No longer I, but Christ who lives in me. Life that I now live, I live by faith. The life that I now live, I live by faith, faith. In the Son of God who died and rose again. The Son became a ransom for all men. The Son of God who took away my sin The life that I now live I live by faith In the one who loves me I'm crucified I'm crucified with Christ No longer I Christ who lives in me I'm crucified with Christ No longer I Christ who lives in me Life that I now live
took away my sin other more. Pour yourself out in your body, Lord. Pour your spirit out. Draw us closer. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the Lord bless you and keep you till we meet again. Well done.